Okay, well, what a pleasure to, to see you. Um, and I'm very grateful to be asked to come. I, I've sat here various times. I've taken part in debates here once or twice over the, the eons. Um, uh, you know, the corn laws, this kind of thing. Uh, but um, uh, I haven't, haven't actually been back in here for a bit. Oh, no, I, that's not true. I came back. My wife is South African and um, incredibly passionate about everything that happens in, in South Africa. And she dragged me along. There was a, um, a meeting uh, about the, the whole business of roads must fall last. Was that last year? I don't know. Lose track, really. Uh, and um, so I, I sat here then and, uh, and, and listened and wanted to jump up all the time, but, but felt restrained um, by doing it. I, I've just, uh, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just, a, I was thinking today, just a, a, another journalist. I mean, there are large, large numbers of, of journalists, of course, and most of them, if not all of them, better than I am. I've only got two advantages. One, that I uh, work for the BBC, um, which until moderately recently had big audiences. And so therefore, uh, you know, the people that are writing for, for, for a newspaper about a subject that I'm involved with uh, might well have far better context and far better understanding of what goes on and, and everything. But I... I had uh, the, the audiences, and the BBC's audiences now are extraordinarily high. I mean, I think uh, up to about 350 million around the world. Now, that isn't just uh, uh, people like me. It's uh, all the language services and so forth that the BBC presents. But it is a, a, a really, really large um, uh, um, um, section of... of I mean, it's a measurable section of the world's population, isn't it? Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that has helped. And the other thing that's helped is just, uh, just sticking in the job um, for year after year after year, boring the pants of everybody, having, uh, you know, having people, young guys, young women, starting off fresh and, you know, they go through their careers, and I'm still stuck there. Um, and, you know, that, that uh, just being in the job for a long time does have some advantages. Um, it has one advantage in particular, that uh, y you, you know, the, the great failing, uh, it often seems to me, of, of, of journalism is that people are um, very kind of, uh, of, of excited and, and infused, which is wonderful, but they think that these things are happening for the first time. And I think, I, don't, I wouldn't want, if I were running a news organisation, I wouldn't want to have lots and lots of old bores around, but you should have a couple uh, who will say, well, actually, you know, I remember when this, that, and the other happened, and it wasn't quite as, you know, so what, what, what you think is, is, is magnificent and wonderful and it's happening for the first time actually has been around for a bit. That, that I think, is quite good. You have to have a balance, I, I, I suspect, uh, in, in age as well as, as everything else. I've, um, I'm now, I'm sure, uh, a, a going to kind of change my, um, my modus operandi. I'm, I'm 73, um, but funnily enough, it's not age that, uh, that, that kind of is, is a concern to me, but it's, it's my 11-year-old son um, who uh, is, is at school here in Oxford. Um, it's why we came to live here, and um, I, uh, I, I just want to spend as much time with him as I can before he's, you know, absolutely, before he actually marries his, his PS4, and, uh, uh, you know, I never, I never see him again, and, and which will, of course, uh, it's, it's already in the process of, of happening. That's uh, a, a reason, real reason, why I... I want to, um, you know, spend a bit of 
time with him. Uh, I've not been able to do that uh, with my two elder daughters by my first marriage, and uh, so I think this time I'll try and get it right. So I'm, I'm negotiating a, a, a scheme with the BBC where, whereby I do something every week, um, but I, I go on um, kind of what it's uh, rather uncool to call adventures after that. So, f for instance, um, 25 years ago, I went to the Amazon, uh, to the farthest reaches of the uh, western part of the Brazilian Amazon, quite moderately close to the Peruvian border, which is uh, the wildest and least, uh, least known bit of it. And I came across an absolutely superb um, tribe of, of people there and spent, uh, spent some time there. And I've, I've thought about it ever since, really. And when I worked it out that it was 25 years ago, I thought, why don't I see, go back and see what's happened to them? Of course, you know, what, what could happen? Well, all sorts of things could happen. I mean, the rubber planters might have cut the trees down. Um, uh, the, um, they may all be wearing, you know, Manchester United T-shirts. God, I hope that's not the case. Uh, or indeed Chelsea T-shirts, which still wouldn't be very good. Um, or they may be, as they were, um, wonderful. And, um, I mean, an example of how, how uh, we, we should be in our, in our social lives to one another. Um, so it's that kind of thing that I want. And I want to do about three or four of those a year and go to difficult places and do all the enjoyable things as opposed to going to boring, easy and dull places, by which I mean Europe, the United States, um, anywhere that speaks English except South Africa, which is more difficult. Um, and, and go and, and kind of start to really enjoy myself after all these years of dedication to the, uh, to the corporation's wishes. Um, so we'll see. I, I, this is what I'm trying to negotiate at the moment. Now, I've, I've, you know, I've been talking to very little effect for a very long time now, so I'm more than happy to take any question. I don't care, you know, no, no, uh, no subject off limits, um, uh, unless I walk out, of course. But, uh, so please, please uh, feel free if anybody does have a question. Otherwise, we could all go home, of course. No? Well, I'll, I'll start with, um, with, with some questions for the next 10 minutes, and then we'll, we'll open up uh, to the audience. So I will give you an opportunity to ask questions, don't worry. Um, Something I was, think, I was just thinking about um, as you described all the travels you've been on um, and, and just your career in general is whether your opinion on humanity has been strengthened or weakened during that career, whether you think people that we are as um, integral as, as, as we were once were or perhaps were not. That's a, uh, that's a superb question, if I may say so. I, I used to... Um, uh, be quite depressed and gloomy about the way that the world was going. But now, when I look back, I, I joined the BBC in 1966. Um, when you look at, at the, just simply at the statistics, in spite of what everybody thinks and tells you, the world is a far more peaceful place than it was in 1966, and definitely a great deal more uh, safer and less terrorist-ridden than it was in the 1970s, which was quite a difficult time for, for in the Western world in particular. Um, and uh, you've, you've got, a, a, and I mean, things like, like poverty slashed uh, really quite, quite dramatically in the last 25 years. Uh, it, poverty has not yet been eradicated. And that wonderful slogan of Oxfam about doing just that, but it, the 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 graph is really going down. Okay, fine. That's mostly uh, Egypt. Uh, this mostly uh, India and and China. Of course it is, but um, nevertheless, I mean, poverty is poverty, and uh, cutting poverty wherever it is is a a, a, a superb achievement. I've I've seen a lot of 
bad things. I've covered, um, I think it's about 48 or 49 wars and revolutions and things like that. I've seen people behave despicably to, to, to one another. Um, I've seen a lot of people killed in, in different ways. I was at the, um, the uh, massacre in Tiananmen Square in 1989. Uh, I was in Romania later that, that same year when a large number of people died in the revolution there. And I've seen uh, other, plenty of other wars. I've seen a lot of nasty things, essentially. Um, and yet, uh, as I've grown older, I've grown much more positive about the way that, that, that human nature is. And um, I've found that people, um, maybe, maybe the numbers of people who behave well under difficult circumstances are nothing like as large as the numbers of people who behave badly under difficult circumstances. But, I mean, it is a little bit hard to, to expect everybody to be a hero and to stand up for the things that they want when everybody around them is, uh, um, is, is, is condemning them. Um, but uh, I can't, I, and it's just one thing floats to my mind, but I promise you there are lots and lots of other examples. Um, during uh, the uh, appalling um, violence uh, in Rwanda in 1994, which I, I, I covered, which has, gave me, um, you know, some of the stuff of nightmares. Uh, but nevertheless, among these people, and I remember finding a, um, a, a Catholic headmistress who had trained the kids in her, in her classes to go out and, and, and kill members of the opposing tribe. And she taught them how, how to kill, how to put the knife in the neck and so on. Um, but opposite, just opposite that school, and that was a, that was a terrible uh, shaming sort of experience to, to see that, to hear about that. Um, the headmistress had flown and the, the kids had, uh, weren't there, but there were some witnesses to that still. Opposite lived uh, a Hutu woman whose life was in grave danger from her Tutsi neighbours. And um, one of her neighbours came to her and said, your life's in real danger, they're going to come and kill you at any moment. Um, let me hide, hide you. And she found a way of hiding here in, a, in the ditch between the two, their two properties and giving her um, uh, straws to breathe through and uh, coming down twice a day with, with food and, and, and drink and helping her out at night time when nobody could see. That woman ran the, the, the chance of perhaps one of the worst deaths that anybody could imagine because, um, you know, the, the was a, uh, there was a bad atmosphere in the air. And yet she did it. Why? Why, you know? You just have to say, I think, that there is something uh, good in humanity. And it may not always show itself. It often seems to say it rarely shows itself, but it is there. And it does come out sometimes at the most awful times. Hmm. Well, so something you were mentioning uh, up in the meeting group was how um, how compromises have were, were sometimes made. You, you saw compromises being made for the, the armed forces in terms of how they approach um, approach interrogating people, perhaps. Um, my question to you is, have you ever compromised your own morals uh, in order to get the truth out from a story or a situation? Well, I've told loads of lies and things like that. Uh, I remember going to, um, I remember going uh, undercover to Zimbabwe, uh, where I'm, I'm slightly awkwardly subject, I think, to a, a seven-year prison sentence for broadcasting illegally. I mean, it not, you know, not the worst of crimes, but nevertheless, it carries seven years in 
Zimbabwe, and I, I, I went there. And um, when I was uh, ar arrested, I, I said I, I was um, uh, a, a professor of, of uh, um, history at, at, at Cambridge, at my college at Cambridge, in fact. Um, and uh, it, it didn't help that the guy said, well, how come I saw you on television last week? <laughs> but I, I said, no, that's my, that's my twin brother. You know, people are always made, what, what was he doing now? I said, oh, God, yes, no, no, that's, that's terrible. But fortunately, that had been in a different, on a different continent. And um, so I, I got away. I don't feel... Um, if, if, there's a, if there's a reason, if there's a good um, uh, cause, I, I don't feel too bad about telling the kind of lies that I would never tell in a social context. I mean, I've never ever pre pretended to be a Cambridge professor at any other, um, in any other, at any other time, whatever. Um, but uh, I, I would, I just think there are some things that don't matter too, too much compared with, and here is where I get both pompous and uh, kind of my eyes start to glisten with phony tears, but, you know, with the duty of bringing um, tr truth out, or as close to, to truth as you can get. <coughs> so I, but I wouldn't do anything... Um, I, I, I honestly uh, am certain uh, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't steal. Um, oh, would I? <laughs> no, I, I, well, I kind of borrowed things, I suppose. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't injure somebody. I wouldn't, uh, um, you know, um, knock somebody down or shoot somebody. Uh, having said that, I, I have been the the subject of a, of a shooting in, in Afghanistan uh, in 1989 when the, the Russians were, were leaving and I, I was in Kabul, the, the Afghan capital, smuggled in by a group of, uh, of mujahideen. Um, and um, the, the secret police, a, a very nasty outfit called Khad, um, discovered where we were, somebody uh, uh, betrayed us. And uh, the Khad people came and, and surrounded the house. And um, I was there with uh, the, the boss of the Mujahideen group that I was with. And uh, um, when the, the door knocker went, um, he, he went out, he said, I'll, I'll answer it. But I think he knew what it was. And he went out and the, the colonel, who was, a, I have to say, particularly unpleasant, evil character, uh, was at the door just checking out that this was really the right address. And he shot him then and there. And so we had to kind of step over the hard colonel's body in order to get out. But if... If that man had said to me, if the, the Mujahideen commander had said to me, um, look, there's only one way out of here, uh, I, I kill this man uh, or you're a prisoner, I'd have certainly, definitely, without any question, have said, you know, hands up, I'm a prisoner. I'd, I mean, I, no, nobody's death, I, I don't want to have anybody's death on my conscience. And the only kind of way I can wriggle out of, uh, uh, out of this is that I simply didn't know until I heard the gunshot and then saw the bloke on the ground. So I'm not saying to you that I've led a pure and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a sort of snowy white existence and things, ha I've, you know, Done, uh, uh, I've done things, I pretended to be things that I wasn't. Uh, I've, um, I've done all that kind of stuff. But in terms of the real crimes, I've, I, 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 don't think I've, uh, I don't think I've knowingly been part of that. It, it's strange that just in a quick story there, you sort of just dropped in that you stepped over a dead body to sort of exit the house. And like, how, how every time something like that happened, were you motivated enough to be like, okay, yeah, next war zone, where's next? How did you keep up that? Was there ever a point you were too frightened or just, just had enough of war zones to, to go back? 
No, I, that, hasn't, uh, that hasn't really been the case. Um, I, I wonder why not. I, th- I, I suppose I just think, I just think it's, it's the job. Um, and nobody forces me to do it. Honestly, I mean, the BBC is the most difficult outfit to work for in many ways. They're always trying to p- persuade you not to do things and it's in some cases instruct you not to do things. And I've actually learned long ago that you, you've got to just ignore that and go with your own, you know, what you think is, is right. But, but nobody, so nobody um, makes me uh, 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 do these things. I just think that uh, for what it's worth, and it's not worth all that much, um, y- you know, to have somebody that has been to 40 odd wars, um, that's had to tread over the odd dead body, that's seen, you know, executions and murders and things, and not suffered uh, too much from it. Um, I think that then, you know, that's actually a reason for doing more of the same. I've got friends, good, good friends, who've been to, uh, um, uh, who've seen, you know, the kind of things that I have and who were completely uh, put off it and would never, never go back to that kind of thing again. Um, and and I, 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 I got every sympathy with them, but I, I, don't, I don't have that. Problem. I think one of the reasons why I don't is that I've I've worked out um, quite a, a, a useful therapy for doing it, which is simply writing in detail about these things. I went to another another thing that happened to me once at a different time in, in Afghanistan. Um, they suddenly announced they were going to hang three people, and uh, I love Afghanistan very dearly, and I, its people are very close to my heart, but they're not always the most organised or most efficient lot. And uh, I, I mean, I've never seen anything as gross and as, as, as disturbing as the hanging, the execution of these, of these three, uh, horribly, horribly uh, botched. And I thought, as I was watching them, uh, watching it, I thought, I'm going to have nightmares about this for the rest of my existence. But I wrote, I, I, in those days, I wrote a column for a Sunday newspaper as well as doing my BBC stuff. And I wrote a, a long article about it. The editor wanted all the details. Um, and so I, I, I wrote about it. And in those days, again, this was, uh, what, in the late 90s or something, um, you still, uh, when you were ab- ab- abroad, you still had to read over your copy to a copy taker. Uh, I mean, this sounds impossibly, it sounds like Caxton, you know, but, but anyway, that's what you did. And, there were, and they were very sort of nice uh, ladies of a certain age, rather motherly, you know. And I, I, I came to the end of this article, 2,000 words, 2,500 words of feeling, you know, I'm just sort of blitzed by it. And she said, oh, you poor poor old thing, oh, they shouldn't make you go and write about all this. But actually, um, that was, that was, I never had a, a, a dream about it, never had a, a dream and certainly not a nightmare about it. I, it is true that I, you know, I, I still see it sometimes in my mind's eye, the, the three men hanging there, but it doesn't have that power to Kind of disturb me and uh, and uh, hurt me like I assumed it would, and I think it's the therapy of writing in detail, thinking about it very carefully, and and I've written you know uh, various books and stuff like that, and gone into these things, and I I think uh, uh, that's it's quite um, it's a way of dealing with it. Mm. Okay. Um, last question from me before we open up to the audience. Um, I imagine that uh, many people uh, have come here this evening um, because they might be, want to be reporters or journalists themselves. Do you have any advice to them on, uh, as they sort of approach the end of their degree and, and move into journalism? It's, it's a very, very different world from the one that I've spent a lot of my time in, most of my, most of my time. And I'm like uh, other journalists, uh, having to come to terms with the ways in which it's 
different nowadays. So, uh, in a sense, nothing of my of my experience really um, kind of, of of matters very much because things are so different. I I just wafted in from Cambridge to the BBC. Um, they thought I'd got a double first, and I swear to you, I did not tell them that. It was my director of studies, and it was only 10 years afterwards, a very typical of the BBC, that I was with the chap that, um, having a drink with the chap who had been the head of the selection board, and he said something like, oh, you Cambridge double firsts. So I said, well, don't include me in that. I got a really crap tutu. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, no, you've, no you, you, you kind of first. So I said, look, no, I, you know, the chances are, if I would got a first, I might remember it. And probably I would raise it in every single conversation I ever had for the rest of my life. Um, and I did get a bad to, I mean, there were reasons, but, but you know, no, uh, there always are, I suppose. Um, and, uh, but so I, I was a sort of pig in a poke, really, taken on by the BBC under totally false pretenses. Turned up my director of studies, wrote me a glowing letter saying, yes, absolutely certain to get a first, one of the finest, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I, uh, um, he, he died before I could thank him. Uh, possibly, yeah, no, well, anyway. And um, that, uh, so, you know, different, different world. But there are some elements uh, that are uh, uh, worth remembering and worth uh, going through. One of them is not just, a, you probably would know this anyway, but not just to say, I want to be a journalist, and then they say to you, okay, so what, if, what journalism have you done? Oh, well, you know, there was a bit in my school newspaper, and, uh, and I, I tried to write something for a, um, you know, for a newspaper at Oxford, something like that. That is not, they're not going to be impressed. They're going to want to see that there's, there's a commitment there. And what I've told various people uh, um, who've, who've asked me for, for advice is, is not an easy thing to do, really, but it's, it's one of two things. Either just to start off right down at the at the bottom rung, sweeping the floors and, uh, um, you know, doing the, the kind of basic, most basic jobs and working your way up from there because that happens in loads and loads and loads of cases. The son of a, of a friend of mine um, uh, just started off in a place uh, I, I wrote to the boss and I said, look, he's, he's, a, uh, he's a good lad. Um, I can't vouch for anything more than that, but he's a nice kid and he's hardworking. Uh, within uh, a month, uh, he'd, he, was, <laughs> he was starting to be paid, that was something. Um, and within, within three months, they'd given him a job. After, I think, two years, he, it's a rather medieval story, he married the woman that was running the place. Uh, and, uh, and now he's, he's enormously, enormously wealthy. And, um, uh, and he's forgotten me altogether, of course. Um, but these, these are fairy stories, but they, they can happen. But I, I mean, the most likely thing is you work in a place, you just say, can I come in and do, you know, do any basic job? And then you find you work out what other people are doing and how they're doing it. You watch them. You see who the people are that are, that are really in charge of the place. And you start to move up. What sort of places? Well, you know, uh, everywhere, every wide place in the, in the road has got a radio station now, doesn't it? It's not, it's not glamorous or anything like that. Um, but it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good start. And then you can go to somewhere, uh, I don't know what, you know, Reuters, uh, uh, the BBC, um, ITV News, you know, any of these. And when they say, so you say you're interested in journalism, what have you done? Then you can say, well, I, I worked for such and such a radio station. I, then I did something for a local newspaper and I did this, that and the other. That's one route. That's what you might call the sort of domestic route. 
And there's another wilder, woollier, and uh, much less uh, certain, but much more exciting route, which is to identify a place somewhere on the, on the map of the world that doesn't seem to get very much coverage, that ought to get more coverage, where interesting things are happening, and beg, borrow, or steal the money to go there and, and work there. And I've, I've got uh, a lot of friends and some colleagues who've done precisely that, who've found out ways of getting into the, into, I mean, one country I'm thinking of particularly is what I like to call Burma, but uh, increasing numbers of people call Myanmar uh, nowadays. A lot of really interesting stories, complicated place, difficult to get to, difficult to stay in once you're there. All of these, uh, these things are true. But uh, to get a, um, a stream from a, a, a newspaper uh, at, a, at a key moment, that's, those are the, that's the, the sort of gold standard of, of that kind of journalism. Well worth it and, um, you know, and it does lead on to other things, but the old traditional route of going in onto the, you know, the graduate training scheme and working your way slowly up through the company, that, that I'm afraid is, is, is dead and we're all uh, on our own nowadays. That's Great. comforting, isn't it? <laughs> I think I prefer the uh, Marian route, if I'm honest. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, right, let's open up to uh, questions. If you have a question, raise your hand nice and high and wait for the microphone uh, to come to you. So let's start uh, at the front here. Thank you for speaking to us today. Um, I was interested in the fact that you've seen all these war zones and all these terrible things, but you still say that humanity has <coughs> progressed so much and we've had such uh, great improvements, you know, much less poverty, much better public health and things like that. Um, so I wonder if you think that the the, the end justifies the means uh, that, so, for example, with China, they have had a lot of success, standards of living improve very much, uh, you know, poverty slashed, as you say, but they've done it in a way which perhaps most of us would not agree with. So I wonder what your take is. Yes, um, uh, that's uh, um, something that I, uh, I think a lot about. I go quite often to China and I've got a very uh, strong views about it in in different ways. Got a lot of friends there, including in the in the in the government. My problem, the problem I have with China, is not, uh, uh, of course, naturally, the uh, the growth of the in extraordinary growth in the economy and the way in which many uh, uh, hundreds of of millions of people live far better lives than they ever did back in the 1970s, for instance, uh, that, that seems to be a, a very uh, good thing indeed. The problem that, that I have is, is, in a sense, a kind of practical one. I saw um, from uh, its kind of um, uh, middle to late um, uh, growth period, uh, the old Soviet Union, and the and the the um, Soviet um, Empire in in Eastern Europe and 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 in Asia, and I I watched um, absolutely uh, spellbound. It was one of the most exciting periods of my life to see the all the revolutions happening in Eastern Europe, uh, the revolution uh, itself, which was uh, scarcely a, a, um, a revolution at the time when um, uh, Gorbachev was overthrown briefly by the, BB, by the KGB, I nearly said the BBC, in, uh, um, uh, in, in 1991. And uh, the, the, the collapse of Marxism-Leninism that we saw then, um, really one of, uh, perhaps even the most uh, uh, important time in my in my life, in my kind of uh, um, in intellectual uh, um, experience, uh, watching how revolutions happened. But the thing was that by the end, by, by uh, the autumn of 1989, um, the, the structure of Marxism-Leninism was, was like an eggshell. 
we still, in the world outside, we still thought that the Soviet bloc was immensely powerful, immensely strong. Actually, a tap on the top of it with a teaspoon broke it. And that's what I think the danger is, and to the great detriment of the people of Russia for a, a decade afterwards, more than a decade afterwards, and still, of course, not the kind of, of society necessarily that one would wish for, for, for a country like Russia. Um, and my fear is that as the Chinese authorities get more, well, it, we're really talking about President Xi Jinping, get, get more and more nervous about the alternative um, uh, opinion structures and, and systems so that, you know, being a Christian is now a, a dangerous and things like, you know, the Salvation Army are treated like, uh, like uh, with, 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 with hatred. Um, that kind of thing uh, is, is really bad in the long term for any society. I absolutely love China and uh, it's, it's um, I, I would, if I could, uh, I, I'd live there and uh, um, would, would live there with great pleasure. And I've, uh, and of course, I, I can't, I'm such a name dropper, but I, I um, you know, I, I used to, at any rate, to translate Chinese poetry and I, I, I've, I've, uh, I, I adore the country and the culture, but uh, I know now from lots of different examples that it, the harder you screw the cap down on it, the bigger the, the explosion is going to be at some future stage. And that's something that I don't wish on the, on the Chinese people. Seven years ago now, I suppose, I was going the rounds of the, the dissidents uh, in, uh, in Beijing and outside Beijing, people that were, you know, put into jail every time a big foreign visitor came to, to Beijing, stuff like that, or the, 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 the Olympic Games came up, they'd all be locked up. Um, but at that stage, seven years, was that six years, seven years ago, um, all my dissident friends uh, seemed to be positive about the future and said, you know, with a bit of luck, one of them said in five years time, I will be a member of the Constituent Assembly of this country. Uh, well, I think he's still in jail now. And um, that, that, and you don't find anybody now saying those kind of things now that President Xi is in, is in, uh, in full flow. And um, it's just my experience that that is not the best way for the future of a country to, to, uh, to control it. Much, much better to find ways in which you can let the steam out and allow people like Mr. Lee to be a, a, a member of the Constituent Assembly. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, let's go to the front here as well. Hi there, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if there are any times when reporting for the BBC that you found it really, really difficult to be impartial? Um, it's kind of, I, 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 do, I feel sometimes as though I've had my, some sort of quite important part of my brain surgically removed and a kind of impartiality uh, uh, sort of cone put into it. Um, I mean, I, I and uh, you know, there are times when I I I, I quite uh, um, regret not being able to just you know blare out what I feel. But mostly, I, I believe I believe this with great great um, um, uh, passion uh, that it's essential to have organizations that are, are obliged by law uh, to be impartial and that if they show signs of impartiality, they will be punished for it, wrapped over the knuckles for it. I don't think everybody should be like that, but I think that it's essential that there should be uh, uh, laws which prevent broadcasters in particular 
from taking political sides. And those laws exist in this country. Um, it's not just the BBC. I mean, if you watch Sky Television, Sky News, Sky News, which is after all part of the Murdoch group and so on, which in, other, in, in its other aspects can be pretty um, red in tooth and claw about, about its politics. Sky News, right down the middle. Why? Because ultimately, if, if it got really bad, Ofcom would take its license to broadcast away from it. So we have this obligation, the broadcasters of, 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 of the United Kingdom, to, uh, to be straight down the line. It, I, I was, the, for a time, I was the, the BBC's political editor in the early days of Margaret Thatcher, which was a very hard time, in fact, because passions were aroused, very strong passions were aroused, and um, it seemed absolutely necessary uh, to, uh, to, to kind of uh, work out why those passions were aroused and to report on the reasons for them. And that used to bring down great wrath from, from the, the, the Thatcher Downing Street on the broadcast. It was always that feeling. I now realise it would never have happened, but there was always that sense in which Margaret Thatcher might decide to abolish the BBC. She actually had far too strong and clear a grasp of what the British people would would take and would accept, something that rather faded in her last years. But nevertheless, she would not have done that. But, you know, we kind of didn't, didn't know that. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm really proud of my, of my colleagues and the way that under difficult circumstances, they, they kept her down the line if you read um, uh, uh, those comments under, in, under newspaper articles on the, on the web, um, I mean, you'll always find there's always loads of people that saying, you know, typical Tory bias of the, of the BBC, and then others saying, it's, you know, it's a complete left-wing um, uh, um, uh, organisation. I, I mean, they can't both be right, can they? There must be something... Wrong. Now, there's a sort of, there's always been, ever since I can remember, there's always been a kind of little mantra that people at the BBC tell each other, which is, say to each other, which is, if the, if the left and the right are both accusing us of being uh, biased, then we must be getting it about right. Actually, of course, that isn't the case. Um, I, I believe that that for all of our of all of us uh, the the big problem not just the BBC but everybody else is um, the, there's a there's a great temptation of objectivity can be made to equal being safe being just you know avoiding the really difficult stuff and that doesn't seem to be to be doing our our public duty at all. Um, but, you know, when you see uh, um, uh, my, my colleague Laura Koonsberg having to have a, um, a, a, a chap to protect her, one of the party conferences, because there'd been so many threats, I mean, I'm sure that there never was any slight danger, but the BBC, for one reason or another, perhaps, perhaps it wanted to kind of draw attention to it, uh, um, gave her that protection that then you can see that things are are difficult and things are getting more difficult but the basic principle that we should be as as unbiased as it's possible for human beings to be which is the demand that's made of on, made on us um, I think is uh, is the right demand and I I'm confident after all these years of working in that outfit uh, that m most of my colleagues, most, almost all my colleagues have kept to that over the years. Sometimes it, it's weird. I mean, you think about somebody like, like Jeremy Paxman. I, 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 you know, the one thing you never, t well, two things you never talk about now, of course, it's all blown out in the open, but one of them is how much you earn. Um, and the other thing is uh, it, it, who you vote for. 
what, what your political opinions are. And, uh, you know, listening to Paxman, I, I, I mean, he just seemed to be really nasty to everybody. I didn't, and, that, and yet then, you know, he, he leaves the BBC and he says, oh, I'm a one nation Tory. Well, I don't know, perhaps the signs were there, but I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. John Humphreys, a really close friend of mine for now 40 years, um, I don't have the faintest idea how he votes and what, what and, and I bet he's actually l like me, I bet he doesn't have a voting pattern. I think he probably votes for the people he thinks are right at the, at the moment. And God knows I've voted for most, well, just about every party there is because I don't, I don't feel a commitment to, to party politics. I feel uh, that I, and, and, and perhaps most of us, stand outside party politics. We watch them, we listen to what they're saying, and then we make our minds up. And that seems to me to be, uh, to be objectivity uh, of, of the right kind. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, let's go to you. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, thanks very much for coming. Um, just following on from that, I was wondering what do you think the best thing to do would be about sort of increasing numbers of people, especially in America, distrusting mainstream media and throwing around accusations of fake news, especially with the sort of seemingly widening gap between what we consider innately left-wing and right-wing media? Well, I, actually, you've, you've given me the opportunity to say what I ought to have uh, mentioned earlier, which is that until the mid-80s, uh, the, until the Ronald Reagan years in the States, uh, the uh, broadcast media had the same controls on them pretty much as the British media still have. And that their licenses were dependent on their impartiality in their political reporting and, uh, uh, and discussions. And Ronald Reagan, uh, I, I thought at the time it was a really bad thing to do. And now, uh, you know, I, I feel that uh, um, uh, even more greatly. Uh, Ronald Reagan lifted that requirement so that anybody could support anybody they wanted. And uh, really, they're only, uh, the only sort of major control over an organisation like NBC or ABC or CBS was the... Uh, the, the, the board of the company that owned them. And there were lots of battles uh, between uh, particularly ABC and its, uh, it, the, its owners, uh, but the owners inevitably won, and the en owners wanted them to, you know, to follow a, usually a, a Republican kind of, of line. And they don't do it too badly even now, uh, that, that sort of the old feeling of the need for impartiality still uh, exists, I think, in the main American networks. But, of course, all these other things have sprung up as a result of, of Reagan's uh, decision. And um, I, Fox News, which I, I, only, uh, I only watch, really, to, uh, you know, to make myself annoyed, really. Uh, <laughs> it seems to me to, to be lacking in any kind of in the faintest scintilla of, of uh, journalistic rigor. And it's just, it's just for, uh, you know, loud mouths to, to sound off on. Um, that, isn't, that is perhaps a little bit unfair because we've seen people s strip away from Fox News on principled grounds. But I think the main, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not my kind of, of outfit, I, I, I would say. Um, and, and of course now in this country uh, we're getting more and more um, uh, kind of uh, um, closer, closer focused um, news organisations of different, of different kinds, um, many of them, most of them perhaps web-based in one way or another, um, which uh, uh, appeal simply to people who know what they think and uh, what, the, what the organizations think and who think like them. So they, you get yourself, it's very dangerous, I think, you get yourself into this little spiral where you only hear what you believe and 
your, your, your own beliefs are reinforced by hearing what the other people are, t- are telling you. And the chances of uh, an open-minded discussion, like uh, you get in some newspapers uh, in this country, um, are, are, are getting less and less and less. I, I read, uh, in particular, the, uh, the Independent and The Guardian uh, every day. I read, I read all, all the newspapers, if I possibly can, every day. Uh, God, that's an awful business. But um, uh, the Independent and the, uh, and the Guardian both seem to me, even though we know which side of the, of the line The Guardian's on, but it always makes space for people of opposing views to write in. And then under them, under their articles, you get, you know, frantic things from readers saying this is outrageous that The Guardian should be polluting itself with these (laughs) opinions. I think the contrary. I think it gives you the opportunity. If you are a Guardian reader, it gives you the opportunity to see how some, at least, other people think and their their, their uh, thought processes. Um, and the, the independent uh, does something of the same. But, you know, they're, they're all in trouble. Um, and um, the, the ones that are in less trouble are the ones that uh, uh, just give one side of the thing and kind of rave on about, about what, whatever that is. I, I find it really, really disturbing and I, I um, you know, I, 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 I do sometimes worry very much about the, the kind of uh, political and intellectual health of a country which uh, is composed of people that only listen to one side of any argument. Great. We have time for one more. Um. I should say my wife, before I came, she said, look, for God's sake, don't be pompous, you know, don't give all these... Think, and I'm sorry, I've been so pompous. Please forgive me. I, I didn't mean to be. Right, yeah, let's, let's uh, last question. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, you touched on it briefly um, about how media is now moving towards the web. And reports show that the majority of people are reading or getting their main news sources from Facebook and Twitter and things like that, and that perhaps we don't have the attention span for the in-depth analytical uh, broadcast that made you so renowned. Um, So do you think the industry can survive? And if so, how? And how can the BBC compete with these sound bites that appear on our social medias? Yeah, I mean, you're you're right. Um, It is a a problem, and it's part of this business that, as I say, that you know, it's, it's just listening to, 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 to people that think the same way that you do. Um, I've, I came across an interview I did in a newspaper. I've just moved. Um, God, what an awful business that is. And um, all our stuff has been in storage for years upon years upon years. And it, it all arrived the other day. And of course, you can't, you know, you mean to clean up and sort everything out, but actually what you do is you sit down and read articles either by or about yourself most of the time. And um, I saw this, uh, this thing uh, that I must have written uh, or been interviewed for or something in 2010 for, for one of the newspapers in which I said how, how worried I was for the future of the BBC. Um, I, I ought, by all, uh, uh, by all accounts, really, to be more worried than I am because um, things haven't actually got better. And as, as, as you say, people are, are moving away, really, from, uh, from, from certainly the main broadcasters in this, in this country. I mean, when, when I, I started off uh, uh, it, it, reporting for... BBC television news, we'd have audiences of eight or nine million a night. People used to sit down in front of the television as though it was some kind of, kind of national duty, you know. And it, was the, it wasn't that they were terribly necessary, terribly interested, but they just felt that was what they ought to do, that that was expected of them, and they made their kids watch it. Um, well, you know, uh, alas, those days are gone. I mean, we, 
we now uh, feel fantastic if we get five million uh, audience. Well, that's not too bad, but it's the, it, it, it's the way that, of course, the audience is made up that's the disturbing thing. I mean, most of them are uh, uh, well over 35, if not 50. Um, and, um, you know, we, we're not able, we seem not to be able to attract younger viewers and, and listeners. Uh, listeners is something different, actually. Uh, radio, on my first day, I've got to tell you this, on my first day at the BBC, 1st of September 1966, I fetched up thinking I was no end of a, of a, of a, um, a great fellow for having gone into the BBC. First thing, and I was working in uh, radio, on the radio news room. First thing that happened to me was some sort of aged character came shuffling over to me and said, my advice to you is to get out of radio as quick as you can. It's got no future, whatever. Get into television, dear boy. And um, I, I, I did, I, well, it took me 12 years, actually, but I, I did finally manage to get into television. But only just now, you know, television is the one thing that, uh, television news is the one thing that is uh, rather uh, on, the, on the decline. I don't think I ever thought that that would happen because I thought people were more, what shall I say, I don't know, interested in the world around them. Twitter, uh, I mean, I, I pump loads of rubbish into Twitter every day. Uh, um, I think I, no, I think I apologised today for something. I didn't turn up at something. No, that was something else. But, but normally, you know, I, I write about what Trump's doing and what, what's happening in Brexit and what's happening in China and what's happening. I love it. And, and it's really nice. And 144, I, I dread the idea that it should be 288 characters because 144 characters, you don't need any specifics, you don't need any facts, just pump out a few opinions and you've got it. <laughs> and they're all clicking and ticking and, and liking. Um, uh, 244, you might have to have, you know, uh, uh, 288, whatever it is, might have to have some facts uh, at your disposal. But um, it's, it, is, it is really depressing. And the lesson from American television news uh, is that the less you tell people about the world they live in, their country and the world they live in, the less interested they are in the world outside. And the more you tell them about, you know, the skateboarding boarding ducks and the thing that happened, uh, the funny thing that happened in the White House today, um, the, the more, the, the broader aspects of their attention start to atrophy and you, you, you lose you lose the knowledge of what's going on. There was a, fir I, I, thank God when in uh, um, 2001, uh, after the, the, the appalling events of 9-11, uh, people started writing in in the angriest terms to the US network saying, you let us down, you didn't tell us that this was building up in the outside world, we didn't know about it, you, it was your job to tell us. And for a little bit, for uh, a few years at any rate, um, the, the networks pumped money into telling people what was going on in the outside world. But it's expensive. Uh, it requires uh, um, good quality, a better quality of people often than, than uh, the, the normal run of, of, of employees. It's, it's hard and uh, it's full of long foreign names. And it wasn't long before the, the networks were telling people less again. And again, that downward spiral, people hearing less about, about the world, wanting to know less about it, needing to know, feeling they needed to know less, less and less. And therefore, the networks who's, uh, it, you know, who are, whose existence is dependent on their audiences, telling them less and less. And that's, that's happened there. I didn't ever think, I, I, I'm afraid, that it would happen in Britain, but it, it's happening right in front of our eyes. And, well, maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't suppose people in Elizabethan England knew a hell of a lot what was going on in France or, or Turkey. 
and they, you know, I mean, they survived. Uh, but um, I just think the kind of world that we thought some uh, decade or so ago that we were creating, where people would, would be open to all information on a broad uh, scale and that we could therefore count on more intelligent and more informed uh, viewers, readers, listeners, whatever, that, that hasn't come about. Um, I'm sorry to end on a, on a, a, a bad note, but I, I do think it's a, a real worry, and it's a particular, should be, I think, a particular worry for educated people. Um, I'm sure that's a deeply non-PC thing to say nowadays, but, but people that have uh, uh, an understanding of, of, of things, uh, I think much is expected and, and uh, required of them. And one of those things is not, I would say, to get into those little tunnels where all you hear is, is the voices of people that think exactly like you do. Anyway, there Fantastic. we go. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, John Simpson. <laughs>